When I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. I'm about the past, I'm about the future. Welcome back to Draft Vice. Today, we're actually talking about running backs. I tricked you the last time. I tricked myself. I actually even walked into doing this episode with the concept of potentially doing tight ends. And then at the last second, I lied and I went, Walter, we're doing running backs. But I'm not doing all the running backs. <gasps> what? This is crazy. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to do tight ends and running backs. What? Yeah, that's right, Walter. We're switching things up. Um, I'm going to do top 14. I'll, I'll do top, yeah, 14 running backs, and we'll, we'll tag that onto the second episode. We'll follow that up. And then I'll finish it up with a little bit of tight end talk, right? Tight end talk. That sounds like actually like its own podcast, Tight End Talk with Greg Olson. Anyway, so let's get into it. Running backs, the sexy position, the number one position in your heart, the value position, everybody. Wow, my face just glowed up right there. Um, why did he just, like, step into the light? I have no clue. If you're listening, you have no idea that there's a light. Um, today we are talking about running backs in fantasy. And the number one overall running back in fantasy is Christian McCaffrey. What? I can't believe it. Really, Walter? Did you really just say Christian McCaffrey? Like, the guy who's been number one overall last few years? I thought you were going to throw something out of, like, the blue. Like, something kind of weird. I thought you were going to, like, do something. I don't know why Aziz and Zara just suddenly guessed it on the podcast, everybody. Um, yeah, Christian McCaffrey. Uh, I, I mean, come on. The guy the last two years has been leading the NFL in receptions. I mean, he's if you're in PPR, you are making a mistake not taking Christian McCaffrey because he just catches the ball out of the backfield all the time. Also, uh, I remember last year I went ahead and, like, moved my, my number one overall spot to Saquon Barkley last year, and I resented that because uh, Saquon was, you know, ended up being injured. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the case. But imagine this year Christian McCaffrey ends up getting injured. Then I'm really going to kick myself. But reality is, outside of injury, I just don't see Christian McCaffrey failing, right? Uh, catches out of the backfield. He's basically, like, the, the, the number one receiver on that team or number two, DJ Moore. Uh, you know, we know that he can be utilized like that with Teddy Bridgewater, uh, you know, provided, you know, I, I think Teddy Bridgewater is going to be a solid quarterback for them. I think it's going to be a solid offense. He's going to, he's at least going to be accurate enough to check it down to, to Christian McCaffrey. I'm sure Joe Brady can utilize CMC, uh, the way that we hope CMC will be utilized because Joe Brady had a similar guy at LSU, by the way, Joe Brady's the offensive coordinator for the Panthers now under Matt rule. And he had a similar guy at LSU called Clyde Edwards Alaire. We're going to talk about him potentially this episode, maybe in the next one. We, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. But anyway, yeah. So CMC number one in your heart, number one in fantasy, like the last two years running. Maybe not number one, uh, depending on the what you play. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what kind of rules you play. Maybe you do thirty thousand first downs, thirty thousand points per first down. But he's been, he's been a top fantasy option the last, you know few years i just can't imagine anybody else who's number two on the list walter why don't we get over christian mccaffrey well fine we're moving on to zeke Elliott, everybody zeke Elliott. i think he's a safe bet right part of i here's what i think people mistake right with football with fantasy football it's about risk management right and the risk management with zeke Elliott, right although i am not a fan of joe looney at center um they did lose travis frederick he's gonna still be solid right they still have the tackles there they're good they still have zach martin he's good uh, Connor Williams and Joe Looney, eh, that kind of worries me a little bit. Not going to lie. I hope they do a lot more outside zone runs. I feel like that would make me feel a little bit better. Nonetheless, okay, uh, Zeke has been good without a, a great offensive line in the past. Like, he, you know, in the years where Travis Frederick's been injured or Tyron Smith's been injured and it's Zeke Elliott coming in, he still, if, he, if they don't have great blocking, still gets, you know, gets the job done. So, Yes, I put Zeke Elliott at number two overall. I understand if you feel like it should be somebody else. Totally understandable, but I'm going Zeke. And I, by the way, how I do my ranks, right? If you want to know, I, I do my ranks twice for positions, right? I do it initially with, like, I look at the stats. I'll do a rundown. I look at the, you know, I'll, sometimes I, I'll pull up some tape. I'll look at the guys again. Uh, and it comes off of... You know, an amalgamation of reasons, you know, whether like the tape score that I give them, which is it's like whose line is it anyway? It's all made up. It really doesn't matter. Um, 
so that's how I kind of do a little bit of my my uh, my my method to this, and then I re rank them off of memory. Like I go a couple of days or even a week or two, and I go, all right, it's time to re rank them. Let's do it off the top of my head, and I just start doing it, and without seeing any list. So Zeke and CMC were top two each time. Also number three, Alvin Kamara. People are probably going like, Walter, Alvin Kamara, really? Number three above Z, above Saquon Barkley? But, like, wasn't – but uh, Kamara was injured last year, too, and Alvin Kamara's got a great offensive line. He's got Drew Brees. He's got an actually functioning offense. And when he's been playing, when he was healthy, he was great. Now, you can also question whether he's – you know, there's a potential for him to not be healthy again this year, but you could say that with any running back in the NFL. So – I'm going Kamara, and then you also know who his backup is. His name is Latavius Murray. If you're really that worried about Kamara, you could always grab Mr. Murray and hope that he can, you know, be an insurance. I don't always agree with that. Like, you know, it depends on how many bench spots you have. Maybe in the year of COVID, if you've changed up your rules a little bit to give yourself a little bit of protection, then maybe it's a good idea to grab a guy like Latavius, Lahorius Latavius Murray. Okay, fine. So after Kamara, who's number four, Walter? Who's going to be number four, Walter? Um, it, This is the part where it gets a little dicey, right? I've argued myself a couple of times. Should it be Dalvin Cook? Should it be Saquon? Should it be Nick Chubb? Uh, all three of these guys have a solid argument for fourth on this list, right? Uh, Saquon, Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook. I honestly... I, I think all are good. I think anybody in the top seven, you're really going to be happy who you're getting, right? Uh, Dalvin Cook's the one that worries me a bit because he's had multiple injuries over the years. Now, this year, he was fine last year. He was healthy last year. He was amazing last year when he played. Uh, very good player. Uh, offensive line, I think, is going to actually be a little bit better this year because they, they did invest a little bit into it uh, in the offseason. Uh, and they're going to, I think, again, Kubiak's going to be doing the same thing Stefanski did. So I, I definitely see Dalvin being a solid pickup. Uh, but I don't have him at four. Instead, I should have him at four. But I, I, there's something in the back of my head with the injuries with him. Now, all three of these guys have injury risk, right? Saquon, injured last year. Nick Chubb was injured in college. So all three of these guys, injury risk, big question marks. I think I'm going to lean Nick Chubb. Maybe the Browns guy in me is is the the, the blood is pumping and I'm going – Cleveland Browns in my heart. So Nick Chubb, I think I lean towards. I mix and I mix and match here though. It could be Dalvin Cook. I could change my mind in thirty seconds. Say Dalvin Cook. I'm gonna say right now, off top of my head, I think Dalvin Cook gets more carries, right? So I I get that, but I also think the offense might be a little bit more potent where Nick Chubb is. Oh, it's a tough one. All right, you know what? I, I, we'll go. We'll go. Dalvin Cook right now. I'm gonna try to push down my love of Nick Chubb. He'll be five, right? And we'll go Saquon at six. Uh, Saquon, athletic freak. He's the game breaker at running back, and we're hoping that he's gonna get to catch the ball a little bit more under this current offense. I don't know what Jason Garrett plans to do. This is my problem with the Giants. I really just don't know. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I don't think anybody knows what the Giants are gonna do. Jason Garrett hasn't been an OC in forever, uh, unless he was just guest starring on the OC, which I don't think he ever did. But yeah, so I yeah, so four is Dalvin Cook, five is Nick Chubb, six is Saquon, and then seven is Josh Jacobs, right? Uh, I I think. Oh, well, okay. Let me go back to to Nick Chubb for just quite a second. The reason why I'm high on Nick Chubb, first off, Nick Chubb led almost led the the league in rushing last year. Um, he is going to be sharing a backfield with Kareem Hunt. I do think it's going to be like a sixty forty split. But I also think they will get on the field at the same time. They're going to use Kareem Hunt in the slot. They're going to get them on the field, I think. They're going to create matchup issues. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot to both these guys getting production in the NFL. Uh, that's why I kind of understand going Dalvin Cook over Nick Chubb. Uh, I also think that the way that they design this offense is very much like beneficial to Nick Chubb. He's a great outside zone runner. They have a bunch of guys who already know the system in Jack Conklin, Austin Hooper, you know, from their times of being in similar offenses. So Joel Petonio as well. So I think that they will be fine running outside zone. Uh, it does actually benefit a lot of the players who are already there. They're going to be doing a lot of outside zone play action. Uh, a lot of guys who are already experienced in the scheme are already there. And then Nick Chubb did his best on outside zone runs. Great one cut runner. 
boom, can break break away game speed. Uh, honestly, like I, it's weird because like one minute I think Kareem Hunt could be a, a like a def, like a detractor from him, and the other minute I go, actually, I think both these guys can potentially be very valuable. So uh, I'm gonna go with uh, Nick Chubb at five after Dalvin Cook, and then six it's gonna be Saquon. Seven is Josh Jacobs. Great offensive line, sexy offensive lines. Probably the second best, if not the best, offensive line in the NFL. Um, and then they've got a lot of speed on that offensive line, uh, on that receiving core with Tyrell Williams, with Henry Ruggs. Now Tyrell Williams is coming off an injury as well. He apparently he might have a he has some kind of shoulder injury, but it, apparently he should still be ready for Week One. It might be an AC joint sprain. Uh, keep keep. Keep an eye on that, though, folks. Um, so with Tyrell Williams and Henry Ruggs, you got a lot of speed. You also got Darren Waller. You got, and then also they plan to use Jacobs in the passing game a little bit more because he's a good pass catcher. So I like all those pieces they got there. The offensive line is good. Really, the biggest question is quarterback on that team with Derek Carr. Whatever happened to Derek Carr and Marcus Mariota? Again, I think that'll be a great sitcom for CBS when they're both done with their NFL careers. It, whichever one it is, though, I think they're still going to be fine for Josh Jacobs because Derek Carr likes to check the ball down a lot, and Marcus Mariota is extremely athletic, so maybe they'll utilize his athleticism if he ends up playing quarterback. Uh, after that, that's the top seven, right? Those are the guys I feel safest with if I have to draft. That's my top seven in my big board, too, by the way. It's also my top seven in my big bird, but that's just a whole other... I have a bunch of big birds named... You know, I have actually 17 emus. Seven of them are named after these top seven running backs. This is how it goes. Um, by the way, one of the big birds is actually just called Big Bird. And uh, so what? the next two or three guys, I think, are... Oh, they have question marks, whether it's the, the how they're utilized, changes on the offensive line, and a scheme. So, number eight is Aaron Jones. Uh, I think he did really well last year. Now, he was a headache to have. If you had Aaron Jones last year, there were games where they all of a sudden Jamal Williams was just r taking points away from you, and you're like, what's going on? Why, why is Jamal Williams in the game? Get Jamal Williams out of the game! So I don't think, you know, like, Aaron Jones is going to be splitting the backfield reps, and I get that, and that kind of does worry me. So it gives these other two guys, the, the next, these three guys, we're going to talk about them a bit, and I'm going to try and figure out where I want them, right? I'm doing ranks kind of almost live. I've done the ranks already, but sometimes, like, when you're talking on the pod, you kind of go, you know what, I can kind of change my mind right here, convincing myself as I talk out loud. So these three guys, right, I talked about Aaron Jones, right? Uh, he was great last year. Oh, almost like the best receiver on the team. So they're going to be utilizing Aaron Jones a lot on that team. Now, I think it's still going to be about 50 or 60% Aaron Jones as far as the backfield goes. Uh, I, I think they might, again, they're going to do more of the Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones combo backfield too, like I saw before about Kareem Hunt and uh, Nick Chubb. So that I, I get. Uh, and again, very potent offense. Uh, when they were getting to do it. They did have a little bit of change on the offensive line. They have Rick Wagner now instead of Brian Bulaga. That is a big deal. Bulaga's a really good tackle. Um, but he wasn't, like, the best run-blocking tackle. He was a great pass-blocking tackle. And I think that's going to affect Aaron Rodgers more than it's going to affect uh, the team, uh, especially the run game. The other two guys in this category, Derrick Henry and Joe Mixon, right? And I have Joe Mixon above Derrick Henry right now, especially if you're in PPR, right? Uh, we saw towards the end of last year a dedication to utilize Joe Mixon. Um, I was a little anemic to Joe Mixon because I'm anemic to Zach Taylor, uh, which is how it goes. But offensive line-wise, I think they're going to be better. I think Jonah Williams coming back off the, the torn labrum. From what I'm hearing out of camp, he's doing really well. Uh, Michael Jordan, not the basketball player, is playing guard over there. Maybe it is the basketball player. Maybe it's his kid. I don't know. Out of Ohio State. Uh, you know, it's weird that the Ohio State guy that's doing well there is not Billy Price, but Michael Jordan, uh, Trey Hopkins, it's center. So at least three-fifths of that offensive line is probably solid solidifying itself. And then the other two-fifths of that offensive line, Bobby Hart, ew, just ew. But again, Joe Mixon's probably got uh, – Joe Mixon's got moves, man. He is the, the new Le'Veon Bell, right? He is the – he's Le'Veon Bell 2.0. I can honestly see the argument of taking him above Aaron Jones. Um, right now, I'm putting him above Derrick Henry. I might even move him above Aaron Jones as, as I get more comfortable feeling with 
you know, Captain Mayonnaise, which is my nickname for Zach Taylor. Captain Ham and Mayo uh, is, is Zach Taylor. Zach Taylor Ham, if you will. That's actually his, his birth name is Zach Taylor Ham. But uh, Zach Taylor Ham, I feel a little bit more anemic with. I don't think Joe Burrow is going to really negatively affect uh, uh, Joe Mixon. I actually would have felt a lot better if they had invested a little bit more on the offensive line in the offseason. They didn't. I think that's why I feel a little bit worried about it. But overall, like, you know, if they get right guard figured out, at least four of the five spots are okay. And I think they can pull that off. I think they'll get at least four of those five spots okay, as long as there's not a bunch of injuries, knock on wood. So right now, Joe Mixon's at nine. He actually probably will move up to eight for me by the end of this episode because I've kind of talked myself into him. Uh, Derrick Henry is at 10. And part of that reason is Derrick Henry does is not in PPR, which is generally what a lot of people still play. Uh, he's not a big pass catcher. He could be solid in the pass game. Uh, I have question marks with the offensive line. There was a little bit of turnover. Dennis Kelly, although stepped in very well last year for Taylor Luan, so I'm not like I don't think it's going to be totally out. Like he's going to probably be taking the right tackle spot if Isaiah Wilson doesn't end up beating him to being right tackle, who's the guy who they drafted in the first round this year. Um, offensive line wise, I think they'll be okay. I'm so I'm, I'm in, I'm intrigued by it. I, I want to see a little bit more out of them. I, I don't know. I, I, that's why yeah, offensive line kind of worries me. Cause you no longer have Jack Conklin, who is like the best right tackle at outside zone running, which is what they were doing last year. Now, maybe I was told by a Titan, former Titans fan, former Titans fan, uh, that they might be moving to a different, you know, scheme as far as running goes. They might add a little bit more gap power. Uh, they might they might have kept the outside zone thing for a little bit of continuity with Arthur Smith, but who knows? Maybe they will stick back to you know doing the outside zone runs. It worked for them before, and it worked for Derrick Henry. So Derrick Henry's number ten, uh, eleven right now. I have Todd Gurley. Uh, I, I mentioned before about. You know, Jamon Brown, I don't know if I mentioned it in this episode or the last episode, but Jamon Brown just got released because they feel good with Matt Hennessy at left guard. Alex Mack still there at center. Right guard is uh, Chris Lindstrom, who they spent a first-round pick on. He's been really good. I, I will hope he becomes really good. I don't know if he is really good. Um, he, he, had a, he had a hard time in the beginning of last year, at least. Caleb McGarry, who they also they traded up last year to get in the first round. You're hoping he kind of starts becoming a, a solid right tackle. Hopefully, maybe, possibly, who knows. And then left tackle, Jake Matthews has been a very solid left tackle. So this offensive line really comes together with their with their potential. I actually can see uh, them being very good. So why not go with uh, a, a good running back, who seemed to be good in Todd Gurley, behind a solid offensive line. By the way, he's getting paid by the Rams to go play for the Falcons. So I'm sure he's kind of wanting to stick it to them and be like, look, I'm still a good running back. See, see, see. So as long as Todd Gurley doesn't get injured, knock on wood, I think they'll be fine. I think they do plan on utilizing him a lot. Uh, I, I think that the offensive line is going to be better. It's going to be, I think, better than the L.A. Rams offensive line was last year. So we'll, we'll see what happens with it. Uh, after Todd Gurley, I have... Le'Veon Bell, and part of my issues with Le'Veon Bell is I don't think the offensive line is going to be good right away. Uh, he's still going to be u- usable, though, and we saw him overcome bad aspects of that offensive line last year, but there's just some, sometimes you just can't overcome everything. Like, he was really good in the first couple of weeks of last year. Um, not having Darnold, I think, definitely hurt him at certain points. Then when Darnold came back, even still... They just, I don't know. I i don't like Adam Gase overall. I think there's a reason why people have a negative feeling about him. but And I know it's a big thing to hate on Adam Gase. But overall, I like Le'Veon Bell. If, if they utilize him in the past game, if they utilize his ability to catch out of the backfield, if he, you know, he's still only 28 years old. He got a year off in the NFL. He's now been a year in the system. He's got chemistry with Sam Darnold. He's a leader on that team. They're going to want to utilize him. Um... I think that there is a potential for him to have a bounce back year and be an RB one. So that's why he's at this like at this twelve spot for me. He's a potential RB one for me, um, and potentially even still a first round pick for me. You know, that, with the ability to move up a little bit. But yeah, so he he's uh he's number twelve on my list. The the real worry for me is the offensive line there. I just and w- with bad offensive lines, it's hard to overcome it. He had a bad offensive line last year. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a bad offensive line, but they haven't had time to congeal. They haven't had time to really practice together. So, you know, you, you're hoping that 
the the guys who are solid that they signed, like uh, McGovern and Van Roten, uh, do well with Alex Lewis and the rookie Makai Becton and Chuma Adoga in his second year, or George Fant, who they signed also. You're hoping all those guys together work really well. After Le'Veon Bell, I'm fighting with these two guys, right? Because this is like the next tier, right? It goes Todd Gurley, jo- uh, Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell, and these next two guys is like the next tier of players. If you do tiers, um, Miles Sanders and Clyde Edwards-Alaire are the uh, are the guys I'm fighting over right now, right? Uh, Miles Sanders has an injury that kind of worries me a little bit. It might ding him below Ceh. Um, just because, you know, you're always a little worried with injury, and if there's a guy who's as like who's equal to in talent and value and, and offense and scheme. I But Miles Sanders came on at the end of last year. It, there were vision issue, issues in the beginning of last year, and I understood why people were, like, kind of skeptical of him. It started to click the last three or four weeks. Like, it really did. And when they got the playoffs, too, like, there was – it started to click for him. He started seeing the field better. I like Miles Sanders. What I saw at the end of the year was not what I saw at the beginning of the year. Um, he's the guy. They plan on him being the guy. Uh, he can catch out of the backfield really well. In fact, for a while, he was like – he was such a boom – receiver for them because they had so many issues with receiver on offense where he was catching out of the backfield and getting multiple touchdowns for him and breaking the game for him and winning them games so honestly I like Miles Sanders a lot so I think it's going to be 13 Miles Sanders provided we hear some good news on the injury um offensive line wise okay they lost Brandon Brooks that's a big deal and it really is a big deal he's like one of the best guards in the NFL uh they still have Lane Johnson they still have uh Kelsey at center uh, left tackle is going to be Dillard or, or maybe Mylotta, but I'm thinking it's Dillard because they drafted Dillard in the first round. Jason Peters is there. He came back to play right guard though, to replace Brandon Brooks. I don't know how well Peters will play right guard. Uh, we will see. I'm hoping he plays really well. I'm, I'm maybe I'm thinking he's probably gonna be a better pass blocker at guard than he will be a, a, a run blocker, but who knows? Uh, so that's like that next tier of the list. Uh, the last guy I want to talk about, we'll get done with 15 and we'll touch back another episode is I have, I, I wanted to do, I want to do, yeah, we'll, we'll do Melvin Gordon, right? I like Melvin Gordon. I, I feel weird putting him here, uh, cause in previous years I'd had him higher, uh, and not last year because there was a whole whole that issue, but uh, his quarterback's not Phillip Rivers anymore. That's kind of a problem. Uh, offensive line-wise, I mean, it, I'm mixed on whether it's really better or worse uh, where he is now. Uh, you know, he's in Denver. Uh, catch out of the backfield. They seem to be invested in Drew Locke. Uh, Garrett Bowles likes to hold people. That's just kind of what he does. Uh, right tackle, Juwan James opted out. So another piece to that offensive line that you maybe would have felt better about. Now they don't have it. They do have uh, the the former right tackle of the Bucks, Don, uh, not Donovan Smith, um, who, who they signed recently. He's like in his like mid thirties though, so he's like near retirement age. They also have Elijah Wilkinson. That might be the guy who's playing right tackle for him. I don't know how they feel about him. Mike Munchak is the offensive line coach. Uh, but we've seen Melvin Gordon overcome bad offensive lines before. He's going to be sharing a backfield with Philip Lindsay. That doesn't scare me that much. Like I get Philip Lindsay has like it's like the Austin Eckler debate. Like there's two different kinds of running backs. Um, and we'll see what Shermer utilizes with these two guys because actually Melvin Gordon might be a better pass catcher than Philip Lindsay out of the backfield. So they might find ways of utilizing his ability to catch the ball and getting him out into space and. He, when you have to try to take him down, he's a really hard guy to take down. So, yeah, I have Melvin Gordon at 15. We are now about halfway through the episode. I'm going to get to RB2s tomorrow. I want to head up the top of the tight ends list uh, while we're doing this. All right. So we're out the back bat because everybody's going to know these top three guys. Uh, George Kittle, Travis Kelsey, Zach Ertz. Top three guys. It, maybe there's a little bit of a gap between uh, the top two and Ertz, but still, those are your safe bets at tight end, right? Multiple years of production, multiple years of being good. If you're going to spend a higher up pick on a tight end, which I don't usually do, 
I, those are the ones I understand, right? Those are the ones who we've seen it, and we've seen it multiple years, so we're okay with it. So we'll get those out of the way. Uh, then comes Darren Waller uh, and Hunter Henry. Those are the next two guys. I think right now I'm leaning Hunter Henry over Darren Waller, right? So Hunter Henry at four. Oh, I don't know. Because, like, I mean, we've seen solid tight ends for, for Tyrod Taylor. But, again, we haven't seen Tyrod Taylor play in a while. But we've seen, like, Charles Clay have a good year. Um, but Darren Waller, like, we've seen consistency. I'm actually moving back. Darren Waller's four. Hunter Henry, you're five. I'm sorry. Uh, if it was still Phillip Rivers there, Hunter Henry would be four. But Darren Waller has Derek Carr. At least you know that he's there for right now. He's the lead quarterback. It might change. So we're going with... Uh, Darren Waller at four, Hunter Henry at five, Gronk is at six, right? This is kind of where I've hit the Gronk territory. Um, what does that mean? Would I t where would I take these guys? I, I haven't, again, I don't have my big board ready for you guys, but I honestly wouldn't take these guys in the top six rounds. Um, maybe right around round six is where I'm okay spending a pick on maybe Darren Waller. Uh, depending on who's there, it all depends on like how the board flies, you know, flushes out. There's usually some value to, to not taking a tight end early. Um, cause we saw last year guys like Darren Waller do pop up and then other guys just don't do anything. You know, last year people were yelling at me, OJ Howard, top four rounds, top five rounds. You know, if he was healthy the whole year, he would, you know, he would have been the equivalent of a fourth round pick. O.J. Howard did nothing last year for anybody. So if you spent a fourth-round pick on O.J. Howard or a fifth-round pick on O.J. Howard, you lost. Now, granted, you, well, you lost out at least on that one round. Um, granted, we saw a full year of production from Darren Waller. It's the same offense, so I can understand people maybe saying, listen, I'm willing to spend a fourth round on him. I can get I understand it. I, I get it. That guy I can get. Hunter Henry and Gronk. I don't know what the plan is for Tom Brady. I don't know what health Gronk is in. Um, so that's why I'm probably closer to, like, fifth, sixth round. Is Like, the sixth round is probably the closer spot for Henry and Gronk if I'm really going to go for those two guys. Um, so after that, it goes Hooper, Andrews, and Jared Cook. Not in a particular order yet. Um I'm going to try and convince myself in different directions while we're doing this, right? Jared Cook is the one with the most consistency around him. I, well, Andrews has a lot of consistency. He's been on, you know, in fact, he's got, he, he no longer has Hayden Hurst to compete with in that back, with that tight end room. So you can make the argument that Mark Andrews should be number seven here, right? Um, he played well last year, but he didn't play a bunch of snaps. It was kind of weird. Like, not for nothing, it was always very weird the way that that offense just bursted out in certain games and he would just end up being open he has great chemistry with Lamar Jackson um so I guess I'm gonna go with Mark Andrews at seven and Jared Cook at eight because Jared Cook has uh Drew Brees throwing him the ball he's you know now third year with Drew Brees uh there's not much else there like there's other pieces in that offense you know, Jared Cook's been solid. Now, you know, you get three years in, solid chemistry. He showed, you know, he showed up pr pretty well last year. If you drafted Jared Cook last year, you were at least semi-happy. So Jared Cook's going to be eight, and then it's going to be Hooper at nine. And you might be like, well, wait a second, Hooper at nine? He's changed teams, Walter. He's not on the Falcons anymore. He's on your Browns. Wait, does that mean you have a, a hint as a – yeah, I've been watching a lot of training camp recently, so maybe I have a little bit more insight into the, the Austin Hooper category. I probably would lean towards Austin Hooper. If I, if I'm at the ninth tight end on the board, I'm probably going Hooper. Uh, I, I'm even maybe a little excited to go a little bit higher than the ninth tight end for Hooper, but I'm not that excited to do it. So I like Hooper. I, I think him and Baker have shown a really good chemistry, so he's my ninth tight end. I would honestly, I would maybe even take him over Andrews and Jared Cook if you're feeling really good about the Browns offense. But that's like that next section is Hooper, Andrews, and Jared Cook. I would maybe, if I was telling somebody to do something, sometimes you know what it is when you're telling somebody to do something, you kind of want to be a little bit more risk averse. Right, so like when I'm giving people advice, I want to say, "Eh, you're probably better off going with Mark Andrews or Jared Cook because we've seen it before." 
We haven't seen Hooper really in a real season with, you know, Baker Mayfield. Yeah, there's a lot of camp reports. Yeah, if you watch the practices, he's done really well with Baker. But, like, that's not saying much. That's just saying, like, oh, I read cap- camp reports. Great. Congrats, Walter. You did a good job with that. Or good watching the the training camp, but that doesn't mean anything in a real season. And we haven't seen preseason yet. So, but that's who I feel safe with at nine. Uh, the next section down, uh, where are we at with this? Uh yeah, the next we'll go to the next section down, right? This is the hard part, right? This this is like the uh, I, this is if you're looking for a safe bet at tight end, and you're not like I need to be winning at tight end. I think Dallas Goddard's the safest guy you can go after this point. Um, if you're looking for high upside, I would go Fant or Ingram, right? The return of Evan Ingram as uh, as a fantasy option potentially, because again, that guy's got wheels. Uh, we'll see if Garrett uses him correctly. Uh, again, I always feel, I'm feeling anemic with anything with anything with the Giants. That's not Daniel Jones particularly. I feel very and Saquon Barkley. I I just don't know. I just don't know how to feel about Jason Garrett and Joe Judge. I they're almost the most. I would say that's the hardest team to figure out of the teams with the new head coaches is is actually Joe Judge and Jason Garrett. Might might work to their advantage. Who knows. Uh, I also think that Greg Olson's one of the safer picks at tight end here. Uh, Tyler Higby actually did relatively well last year. This is actually kind of now starting to become not an order, but kind of just like thoughts on different tight ends. Um, at I you know on my second time of doing the tight end list, I have Fant at ten, but my first time of doing it, I had Dallas Goddard at ten. Uh, Evan Ingram's ended up at eleven both times, uh, and then and then it's basically. Uh, 12 was Noah Fant on one list and 12 was Goddard on the other list. So these, those are probably the next three guys about how I feel okay with them. Chris Herndon, a lot of reports out of Jets camp. Um, I feel solid with going after him. He's a late round tight end. I don't think any of these guys, everybody from like, even Austin Hooper, I wouldn't really want to waste anything more than a ninth round pick on Austin Hooper. If you're spending a, anything earlier than a ninth or a 10th round pick at this point on tight end. Uh, basically, Hooper, Andrews, and Cook, I wouldn't want to spend anything more than an eighth or a ninth round pick on. And, you know, Fant on or Goddard on, I don't want to spend more than a 10th round pick on. Like, it, it should be like 10th or 11th round you're spending picks on these guys. Uh, Herndon, Hawkinson, Gusecki. Olsen, I think, is maybe the safe guy. Like, uh, you know, it's safe is all relative. Like, uh, you know, Olsen might be a guy who, like, you're sitting there going, like, okay, I could see myself taking him here because I don't want to lose at tight end. I think he'll be okay in the Seahawks system. You know, I think he'll get uh, along really well with uh, Russell Wilson. I think maybe he'll be a safety net for him. And there's a lot of speed on that offense, so I think teams are going to be paying attention to DK Metcalf, Philip Dorsett, um, uh, Tyler Lockett, those guys are probably more dangerous to a lot of other teams than necessarily, you know, uh, Greg Olson. You know, he's going to be running free, even though he really, you know, he's he's just got to be veteran savvy kind of deal. Yeah, I, I think he's going to be like the safe bet guy that you're going for, right? Like you just want to at least get a few points a week. Um, Hawkinson, you know, year two for Hawkinson, you're hoping it takes a step forward, you know, gets a little bit more chemistry with Matt Stafford. That first week, Hawkinson looked like what we thought Hawkinson could possibly be last year, and then Hawkinson got injured as well as, you know, Stafford, and uh, it was just a mess last year for the Lions offense, and they still were probably better than the Lions defense, which isn't saying much for uh, Mr. Matt Patricia, if you will. Uh, Gesicki? I this guy's a receiver in a tight, you know in the tight end position. Like he's, I think they're going to utilize him a lot this year. I don't know what where he ends up in the pecking order, but he he did show a bit at the end of last year. He was the only game in town outside of Devontae Parker, so basically Fitzpatrick had to throw it to him. But he's athletic, he's fast, so teams, you know, I think teams will start keying in on him and being like, oh wait a second, this guy could actually wreck us a little bit. Um, he came out really raw, and he's still, you know, his blocking is getting better. Uh, he, I think he's going to be potentially a guy who takes a step forward at tight end. So, again, if you're looking at a guy who, you know, again, a couple of years ago blew up the combine, who has some extreme athleticism, I, I think that's a guy who you can probably jump on and say, all right, like Gusecki looks like he's a uh, potential maybe like super athlete, superstar tight end. So that's a good shot to go take. 
And if you look at Chan Gailey's offense, who's the new offensive coordinator there, he likes to kind of run like a spread system with a lot of matchup issues, getting like tall, lanky receivers matched up on linebackers, kind of like, you know, he did that with Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker a couple years ago. You know, he can kind of do that with Gasicki in the slot and maybe trying to get Parker or Preston Williams also in the slot as well. Uh, I, I think that there's some under, like there, there's something good to that. Herndon was a big you know, fantasy, you know, off-season guy last year that, you know, ended up getting suspended, so he kind of didn't do anything, and then, like, you know, it, then there was injuries, he didn't come back, so, you know, again, I'm not a huge fan of taking anybody in the Jets' offense outside of Jamison Crowder and Le'Veon Bell, but if you're gonna take a shot on tight end later on, Chris Herndon's a good one to take a shot on. Uh, Higby, I feel weird about because it could easily switch. You know, I know he did well last year in fantasy, um, but it could easily switch over to Gerald Everett, who's a little bit more of the Jordan Reed kind of type tight end, which maybe you know we saw them run a lot more two tight end sets. Um, Higby's kind of more of the solid blocker, but you know if Goff has a solid relationship with them, if they try to start utilizing kind of the matchup issues with those guys, I could see like Higby potentially bouncing back and being a top 15 tight end again. I don't think that this is a really high ceiling for him as well. There's Tyler Eifert, who is now kind of like in that category of he maybe could have another amazing season as Tyler Eifert. You know, he's had injury issues in the past, but he's showing good chemistry with Gardner Minshew. Um, he stayed healthy all year last year, so he got a contract in Jacksonville. He got a, you know, so we'll see if he ends up playing well for them. Uh, then there's also Ian Thomas, who now you're hoping he comes along, Dawson Knox. Those two guys are guys who I think can take a step forward, can be real fancy stars, and you probably don't have to spend a high round pick on them. Um, they're not the... You know, they're not the main crux of their offense, though. So maybe nobody's paying attention to them. But each have shown moments on tape of being solid players. Um, Jay Sternberger is like the only tight end in town in Green Bay. Uh, they got rid of Jimmy Graham. Um, but there's not a lot on tape of the guy. He literally had three targets and three receptions in the playoffs, and that was it. We'll see what ends up coming out of him. John New Smith, if you're really desperate. You know, if you're in a deep league and you screwed up and you didn't grab a tight end, Jonu Smith, like, you know, get the guy who's get, catching balls from Ryan Tannehill, has good chemistry with him. Um, Ebron and Vance McDonald are shoring up the tight end situation in, in the Steelers' locker room. I'm not quite sure how you feel about that. Overall, I don't think I missed anybody. Um, Dawson Knox, James Serter, Darren Fells. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess you can go for Darren Fells, kind of like long-in-the-tooth guy. But, again, catching balls from Deshaun Watson has a good relationship with him. Uh, I don't know if you want to go for Jordan Akins either. Not really another guy I'm really looking to do. Um, I, any final thought? Kyle Rudolph. Kyle Rudolph, another guy who uh, could be a solid starter at tight end, so maybe you won't be losing every game at tight end, or we'll, you'll at least have some potential opportunity there. Uh, it's just a, uh, Hayden Hurst, another guy to look at, right? Uh, guy who Falcons traded for. You know, They do need a third target. You know, there's, there's kind of a, a a bunch of targets have left Atlanta, right? And sure, a lot of them will go to Julio and Calvin Ridley, maybe even to Todd Gurley. But now they they trade for Hayden Hurst. He's been in the NFL for a couple of years. They trade a second round pick for him, so they must have thought really well about him. So that's another guy who you know maybe you could take a spot on to see like what he can do if he's developed some kind of chemistry. Jack Doyle, you know, we know Philip Rivers likes his tight ends. Uh, like I said, tight end after, like, the top 12 are really just an amalgamation of who do you think is going to do well, right? Like, it's kind of weird because it's it, – it, it, grab a couple uh, – you know, I don't think I'd, I would, I don't think I'd ever draft more than two tight ends in a particular draft. Maybe this year more people are doing it if they have more bench spots. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I'm, yeah, like, Jack DeWill might be a solid bet. Like, I don't think Trey Burton's going to really, you know – rumble with Jack Doyle for, for target spots. Jack Doyle's kind of more of the blocker slash pass catcher there. So I, I can see, you know, Phillip Rivers, he liked Hunter Henry all those years. He also liked uh, Antonio Gates. Uh, he's going to have some uh, targets to throw around there. I, I think that's also a potential option. Uh, last thoughts. Again, I think Mike Kosicki might be one of the, the guys who – jump up this year so he might be one of those later round guys that i target because they lined him up outside quite a bit 
But none of these guys I would spend more than a 10th or an 11th round pick on. Like, I, these are, this is where you wait on tight end, and if one doesn't work out, you go ahead and get another one. Or maybe you draft two in the late rounds because once you get to that spot of the draft, there's a lot, like, of slim picking. So it depends on how deep your league is, how well you know your league. Um, this is a great episode. I'll touch more on the running backs, the, the rest of the running backs, on the next episode, and then we'll do receivers, right? If you want, you can follow the podcast at DraftVice on Twitter, at DraftVice underscore football on Instagram. You can follow me at B-R-O-J-O, Death is in the End of Life, Punch, like a delicious drink you drink in the summer. Uh, check out my other podcast called Punk Law 101, which is a legal news podcast I do with a friend of mine named John Rinaldi, Legal Aid in New Jersey. I probably shouldn't mention Legal Aid at all, that, that, but I'll, I'll cut that out. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so check out uh, Punk Law 101. Check out DraftVice. Check out the Instagram and the, the website, DraftVice.com, because those are going to have the ranks, right? So when I post these ranks, they're going to be on, on uh, Instagram. They're going to be on the, the website. Those are the two options you got. Maybe I'll post them on the Facebook as well. We're on the when I woke up this morning, I was pretty dangerous. I'm about to pass. I'm about to pee.